welcome everybody to our first Poker Talk for 2022. Um, I'm Amanda Vojtovic, the President of the Friends of the Orpor. And if you're not a member already, there are some brochures out in the, uh, at the desk. Please join. Um, <laughs> first, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, Palawa, the first people of uh, Nipaluna, Tasmania, who never ceded their territory. I also acknowledge the Muanina people on whose land we are meeting and I respect their elders, past and present. Our two presenters today uh, warrant no introduction, everybody says that, but I will be brief. <laughs> David Owen is an author uh, of, that I really love, especially his puffer fish books and I hope that many of you have read them. Uh, but they are a small part of his, of his literary and scholarly output. Uh, his role at Government House and expertise, and I learn the enthusiasm of his wife, Leisha, who is our uh, curator here, um, has resulted in, with Kate, uh, the books for today's talk, uh, who, which are displayed here. There are some in the library case, but as you know, you can't access them because they're locked away. Um, Kate Warner is a scholar of immense experience and our greatly loved governor for the past six and a half years, and together with David has put together these amazing volumes. I have some sheets here which I will make available to you as you're leaving or I'll just pop them there and uh, they allow you to order a copy uh, and in the Colonial Gallery you will find a display including um, a page from Morton, a photo of Morton Allport um, and uh, at Government House, the Allport's at Government House, not Morton Allport, uh, something from Morton's album and Lady Hamilton's watercolours which are featured in the book uh, she was a governor's, a governor's wife who, who painted beautiful watercolours of the uh, house. So without further rabbiting, I present David Owen and Kate Warner. Thanks so much, Amanda. I love David too, of course. <laughs> he was my official secretary and I love his books. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Amanda, and it's wonderful to be here, so thank you all for attending. Um, I think based on experience of having done these a, a couple of times, we'll probably take about 40 minutes, I think, approximately, yeah. and then clearly if anyone's got any questions, we're more than happy to, to take those. And as you can see, we'll be doing this in the form of a PowerPoint. Look, clearly the image is not huge, but we will talk about the images, so hopefully that will you know, bring them to life, as it were. Yes. So what we might do, folks, if we start with, with that one, um, it, it's by the uh, surveyor George William Evans, it's 1827, and um, some art experts have looked at that and they've thought what was going to be constructed there above Hobart in, well, 1827. If you were to be able to have a good look at that, you could see in the bottom right-hand corner we have a very well-dressed individual who I take to away. have been John Lee Archer, the colonial architect who had come to Van Diemen's Land the year before. Potentially there he is kneeling in his expensive clothing, talking to the foreman of works. Now, when Governor Lachlan Macquarie was here in 1810-11, he was very scathing about uh, what the state of Hobart was, and he then said we need to lay out all these grid streets, the seven principal streets, and he said you need a new government house and you should put it up at the front of Macquarie Point. So I don't know if anyone's listening in 2022 about what to do with Macquarie Point. But anyway, when George Arthur became the Lieutenant Governor in 1824 through to 1836, one of the first things he did was to say, yes, the present government house where today's town hall is is a terrible building. We need a new one, but it's not going to be at Macquarie Point. We'll put it up on the domain. And John Lee Archer and foundations were built in the 1827-1828. I'm of the opinion that that's probably what that image is, but I can't prove it. Hmm. Shall we go on to the next one? Yes. Okay, let's have a look. There we are. Yes, so that 
is a very early image of Government House. We think it's the earliest image, the earliest one we could find, and it is a painting by Emily Bowring. And is that held here, David? Is that one in the old port or not? I'm not sure. Um, it is. is. It, it is. is held here. So that is very interesting because it's before some of the um, landscaping features were included. So you can see there's no iron fence around Lyons Court to the left of the picture, and there's there's no quatrefoil stone wall either around the house. Instead, there's that sort of circular bed, flower bed, and um, that, of course, is no longer there. We have a different way of, of getting out of Government House now. In those days, obviously, you had this circular um, driveway going around that, so I guess the carriages went around it. Yes. Yeah. But later on, they built a driveway in front of the cottages, and so the carriages used to exit that way. Because you could imagine how many carriages arriving and dropping people off and picking them up yeah, it would have been. been constant, yeah. And they had hundreds of people mm. going to events, so it would have been chaos. Yeah. And also you can see there, folks, on the left of the building, what we call Lions Court, which is the principal entrance, that, that was not there. And what we do know as well is that uh, when Governor Henry Fox Young and his family moved into Government House uh, on the 2nd of February 1858, the building was not complete. And we'll probably get back to this later, but the area around where the ballroom is and the conservatory, those were the areas that were being constructed last, not least because the ballroom was the principal interior workshop. All of which is by way of saying that when that first governor moved in, and that image there is, is probably an incomplete building, just about. So, so it's a very important, rare image, really, in respect of government house. Mm. Mm. Okay, where it's right there. Just click, click. Okay, here's, here's our, 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 our... Well, it's not a trick question, actually. But as members and friends of the Allport, does anyone think they recognise the little white building in the centre of that image? I can tell you that the painting dates back to 1812, so it's an early Van Diemen's Land image. The reason we've got that there is not only to prove that we're not southern-centric, it is the government house, a cottage in Launceston, so there it is, and that image is held at the QV mag. Mm. We don't know what happened to the building. There is, I believe, a park in the main... Um, I don't know the name of the park in the centre of Lonnie. There is a park there yes. saying this is where I this building was. But yes. I've also read that that park was in the wrong place, but I don't know. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So that was where... There were a number of government houses at that time, one at New Norfolk and also the one at Port Arthur. Oh, is that? Yeah, I think you can see that. That's an 1881 watercolour plan, which was really useful for David and I, working out you know, how things have changed over the years. So at the bottom of the, um, of the plan is the current entrance and the entrance at that time to Government House. So you can see the driveway, which goes past the fernery and then the quarry pond. But what I think the first thing that intrigued me about this plan was that on the left there's an oval tennis lawn. And I thought, how odd, 1881 they were playing tennis on an oval lawn. And we did a bit of research and found that, yes, in those days that was just the very beginnings of lawn tennis and they played it on an oval lawn. And then when the Hamiltons arrived in 1885, but they were there between 1885 and 1890, they built the current tennis courts at Government House, two lawn courts and one Antikar court, and the little tennis pavilion there. That's so right, yeah. at first, though, there was an oval tennis lawn, and I think they'd played them first on croquet, and then they started playing tennis. And the other interesting thing in this, well, there are many interesting things in this plan, particularly when you can read the writing, but also um, towards the left-hand corner, top left-hand corner, you can see an octagonal building which is labelled Fowl House. Which we can get to now. We can. And we actually found the plans for the octog octagonal Fowl House. Not only the plan of the outside, but also the plan of the yards that went around it. So it was divided into four separate yards with yes. labelled for different kinds of um, poultry. 
So they were very keen on their poultry in those days. They certainly were, and so they would import various breeds and have them in each of those octagonal uh, spaces. And there are a number of photographs of Government House with, with that fowl house fairly reasonably visible, which makes it yes. all the more interesting, really. We're not sure what happened to it. Perhaps it just became derelict. Yes. It could have burnt down, but, but we don't know. I that. don't think it burnt. Mm. I think it just must have rotted and they dismantled it, we think in the 1920s or so. Something like that, yep. Okay, now we need to go on to the second row. Where's Clifford? Can we perhaps move on to the second row of images? Good stuff. Oh, we'll use okay, that one. perfect, that's great. So, what we'll do now is we'll go back to the 1881 plan. Uh, one of the other features of this plan, if you look towards the bottom left-hand side of the image, for those of you who can see it, there are three. There is evidence there of three structures. Those are well and truly still with us, and they also hark back to well before Government House was was built up there on the domain. Uh, those three structures were built in 1840, 1841, as part of the Ross Bank Magnetic Observatory, which was put up there because there's such a deep base of sandstone and in order for these magnetic um, instruments to work without or with minimal interference the, the, the sandstone base was ideal because it's got virtually no metal in it so that's why it was chosen as one of a number of um, magnetic observatories to, to look at the southern hemisphere oceans, there was one in Canada there was another one in India they were like a necklace of them around the world and so it was quite a significant observatory. And those buildings, as I say, they're still very much with us. One is Ross Bank, the official secretary's residence. Another is, is, is part of our orchard. And the third one, which is a beautiful building, has been subsumed into a 1960s weatherboard, which is not great. But, you know, that's just the way it is. We've got a image of it. We do. Um, yes. We do. Yes. So, yeah. And the other thing to note in this plan for the moment is in the centre, there's the quarry pond. So this plan is 1881, so the quarry pond had been landscaped by that stage. And this was really the work of Frederick Weld when he was governor. He was governor between 1875 and 1880, and so he obviously um, had done the landscaping. And we know this because he wrote to his wife soon after he arrived in Tasmania. She was still in Western Australia waiting the birth of their 10th child, I think. And um, he said that there was a wonderful area that could be developed and landscaped into a quarry pond. Or, yeah, a quarry pond. But the next image shows it before it was landscaped. So that is almost certainly in our cape. We need to move a bit because there's two I know, figures there. Yeah. Oh, so, how do we... you can see there there's two figures in the bottom right hand as you look at it. That's Henry Fox Young and Lady Fox Young. That photograph is 1858. So it could well be the, the earliest photograph of Government House, looking across at the house from the Quarry Pond, which was obviously pre-landscaped. And for those of you who are visitors to Government House, you will know that as you approach the main building on the left, there's a giant sequoia, which is about the height of the building. Apparently it's still a baby, but it's a big tree. And you can see there, there is no sequoia there. And because the view of the building from this side of the quarry pond is such a such a, a popular view. You can literally see through the decades photographs, paintings, drawings of that view with the sequoia changing height, which is a really good way of looking at dates. But anyway, there we are. Yes, and the next image is of the quarry pond today. So that's a pentaler image. So it really is the most beautiful spot. And a lot of people who come to Government House miss it entirely. But we have to say it's had its ups and downs because it's so conveniently located to the house. It was often a convenient place for dumping rubbish. And at one stage, there was an edict from the Auditor General saying that... We can go back in front of the web now, shall we? Yes, that everything... Um, Everything that was had to be disposed of, china, furniture, old lamps, could not be sold or taken to a tip. It had to be thrown into the quarry pond. So this seems outrageous. This continued until 1961 when the official secretary of the day, Edward O'Farrell, said, 
this is ridiculous. Do we really have to keep putting all of this stuff into the pond? It's going to, you know, fill up the pond and stick out from the surface <laughs> of the water. So it stopped from then. He did have to write some fairly serious correspondence to, you know, to the government. But um, well, who knows what's done? And as it happens, uh, um, when when Kate was governor, she and Dick asked members of the University of Tasmania Dive Club to go down and they spent an afternoon there. Mm-hmm. Now look, the visibility is very poor and the technology they had was not that great, but all they were able to say is that there's sludge about you know, mm-hmm. two metres deep. So I guess with advanced technology it would be very interesting to see what actually is down there. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah. So we're back to the plan again and this is just to focus on the bottom of the plan, the fernery and rockery area which is another area that was um, landscaped in the the time of Governor World. And this is really an interesting area because at first it was a rockery and it um, was loved by many of the governors, but particularly Sir Ernest Clarke. And there he is. When he was governor, he really did a lot of work on this rockery. And so there he is with workmen... um, fixing up or talking about the redesign of the rockery. Obviously you can't see much in the way of flowers there in that picture, but we do know from the next image, which is a painting by Diana Johnson. 1939, that one? Yes. And we really didn't know, I mean this painting was hanging behind a door upstairs on the upstairs floor of a government house. And when I looked at it, I thought, that looks like the rockery, because I recognised the rocks. But of course, since that day, it has changed, and the, it is now a pond rather than a rockery. Mm-hmm. And the reason for this is that when it became wet, it often filled with water. Mm-hmm. And so they, it was made a big mess when this happened, when there was a bit of a flood. And so in the end, they just gave up and decided to make it into the, um, to the Japanese pond and garden as it is today, which is, I think, very beautiful. Mm, it is. It's a lovely, it's well, a lovely picture. That's the next image, so you can see the difference. So that is a is. transition. And more work has been done in this area quite recently, so we've now got a, an archway too, mm. haven't we? And also, we have quite a few populations of native hens, and they disperse themselves as they do, and there's you know one or two that, that's their home, and they love it. But... Um, just getting back to the Diana Johnson artwork, the bulk of the artworks at Government House are on loan from TMAG, but over the years, Government House has developed a collection. It's been an inadvertent development. It's been works that have primarily been donated. So it means we've never really had an official art collection policy, which I think is a slight shame, uh, and it would be very nice to be able to, to change that. And while we're on that general subject, when Government House was first uh, designed in the 1850s, there was a design for a library. We'd have a beautiful image of the proposed library. That never came to be. Um, And so there's never been a Government House library. There's been plenty of books, but they've come and they've gone. And can you imagine if we'd had, or if there'd been a library development policy from day one, what that collection would be? But alas. So we're, we're trying belatedly to make amends, and in fact, We've, we've been donated some beautiful books by this wonderful library in Tasmania, so thank you for that. Yeah. Okay, where are we? There we are. Ding. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the hexagonal building I referred to earlier that was built in 1841 to house magnetic, uh, to house magnetic instruments. Mm-hmm. And the reason you would not be able to see it today is because that is the building that's been subsumed into a 1960s weatherboard house, which, you know, it's a shame. But, but you know, that back then I guess there wasn't quite the same feeling of we've got to protect these at all cost. Oh. It is being protected, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> now we've got a bigger image now. I don't know how we get. Back oh, to look it. at that! Wonderful. Yeah. So that's. Okay. I don't know how that happened. Is this Terrific. the next one there? Do you think? You've done something. Well done. <laughs> We've gone back to small. Okay. I wonder what. Gee, what let's go back to. That's this. number 15, so we're okay. the right number. Yeah. How do we make that go bigger? Do we just click What's on that it? One? Oh, click on the other one. Just let me interpolate here momentarily, ladies and gentlemen. 
gentleman for yeah. you that's gone back. This okay. is the second only webinar of this series, and that, that is meant what to that? explain oh. to you no. why the display is the way it is, just go back to and why we can't yes. have a full scale. Uh, okay, well, look, image. yeah, that's okay, folks. We'll, look, yeah. th why this. Why we've got this photograph in the book, it's by Ludwig Becker. It was painted in 1852, and it's a regatta. So clearly the regattas had been going for some few years. The reason why we've got this image particularly, though, is that for those of you who can see at the top left of the hill is a structure which was where the lieutenant governor and their friends used to sit and watch the regatta, and that was called the pavilion. And that's why that area is called Pavilion Point. So it's nice to be able to use an artwork to do a bit of sleuthing that way. Hmm. Okay. Quiz question. Yes, quiz question. Someone must know what those building, what that building is or was. It was the exhibition building. What a wonderful building! I don't know why it was summarily torn was, down. Does anyone know why? It was agreed that it, the whole point. Before they built it, they agreed that they'd pull it down. Is that right? Wow. Well, I think so. Yeah, yeah. But don't rely on that. Yes. So it's really got nothing to do with Government House, except it's in the approximate vicinity, and what a beautiful building it was. <coughs> OK. There we are. So this is the Gore Brown family in Lions Court. And David and I wanted to talk about the families that lived at Government House, as well as just the governors. So we found that a lot of children had actually been born at Government House, starting with the Fox Youngs. Their youngest daughter was born there. And with the Gore Browns, we've got here, I think, Mabel, Harry and Willie um, on the right-hand side of the picture. And they had more children, so two of their children, three of their children were born at, at Government House too. Yeah. And, uh Governor Gore Brown is on the extreme left, holding the halter of the horse, and sitting on that horse was his private secretary, Mr. Chichester, and Lady Gore Brown is at two across with the black um, hat on. And I'm sure many of you will, will know that Harriet um, McFarland did fantastic work transcribing Harriet Gore Brown's diary. She spent many years doing it here in, in this building, or at home, I guess, and it's available online. I know that. No. Yes, so yeah. that is recent. Yeah. But she gave us an advanced copy of parts of it. She did. And it was really very useful to find out exactly what was happening and how they used the house. So I, I loved um, reading her extracts. She did she, lots of extracts about, you know, the garden and the animals and the, the farm animals that they had and, and so on. Very lively. Yeah. So here is Thomas Gore Brown again. So he was the second governor. He is standing outside the main double green doors of the Lions Court with his hungry looking Irish wolfhound. wolfhound. Yes. I came across that image purely by luck. I was doing some research. Um, I got onto University of New South Wales website. I think it's the Mitchell Library. And there I came across that image. I don't think it actually mentioned him by name, but suddenly there it popped up. Brilliant. So, you know, who knows how many images are out there that are just, that, yeah, yes. come across him by luck. Absolutely. But there he is. So, and behind him is a mounting stool, which was obviously very important for getting into the horse and buggy. We still have that mounting stool. Okay. And stables. Oh, yes. This is the bathing house and jetty. So this was um, used by the early governors a lot. The position of it is just near the lower car park of the Botanical Gardens, and you can just see the remnants of it there. But in the early days, the families used the bathing house, and they also kept their boats there. They also used the jetty for um, official visitors, particularly those who'd arrived by sea and were on ships. Yes. So that was the way they'd just come to Government House by landing on the jetty. Yeah. Yes. And, I mean, again, there's a very interesting sort of story about what happened to those. They, they slowly fell into disrepair. I think once the railway line was put through, it was just that much more physically difficult for the governors to make use of them. And by the 1910s, 1920s, they were full of graffiti and, and yes. so, yeah. Yes. Although the Hamilton still, and this is 1885, he had a whaling boat built and he moored it down there and would go sailing. 
So it was still, you know, quite widely used until the until the twentieth century. Okay. So this is an interesting one. In December two thousand and fifteen, I had reason to be spending uh, Christmas. Lisa and I in London, and on Boxing Day we went to Kew Gardens. And in Kew Gardens, there's a freestanding brick house, and it's I think it's got a permanent collection in it of the botan Victorian botanical artist Marianne North. And in the center of the main room was a, um, a display table, and on top of the dis display table was a glass display case with a platypus in it. So I looked at it and it said, platypus from Government House Tasmania. So I <laughs> thought, what on <laughs> earth is going on here? Um, Marianne North, because she had traveled so extensively internationally, and because she was a very well-known late Victorian um, botanical artist, she had written a diary. And in her diary, she wrote about her time in Tasmania. She stayed at Government House in an upstairs room, which is probably the Duke's suite. She wrote about a platypus that lived in the South Terrace um, pond, the, the, the fountain. Mm -hmm. And then she said, one day, the silly platypus was trying to climb the steps, and it fell over and broke its back. Mm -hmm. And so she had it stuffed and mounted and took it back home. So there it is. Yes, so the British governors were really interested in the platypus. So at this time, in 1880, 1881, yeah. they hadn't solved the mystery of the platypus. So it was of great scientific interest, you know, a, a mammal that laid eggs. So yeah. people just really didn't believe it. They thought it was a fraud that somebody had sewed a duck's bill onto, you know, an aquatic furry animal. So it was really unusual. A lot of governors continued to have platypus. They did. They certainly did. So mm -hmm. um, Sir James O'Grady yeah. put six platypus in the quarry pond pool, hoping to breed them. And he used to take visitors down to look at them. And we also heard from Susanna Cross, now Susanna Sitwell. She was Sir Ronald Cross's daughter, and this is in the 1950s. She was a child with her sister at Government House, and they had a pet platypus that used to come up to the Lions Court steps and they'd feed it with worms. <laughs> she also had a, um, a wallaby that she kept on a lead. And so she would take the wallaby for walks on the lead. And when the Queen Mother came to stay at Government House, she um, was taken to see the wallaby mm. by Susanna on the lead. Amazing. <laughs> OK, so <clears throat> this is an aerial photograph. I think it dates to about 1921. And there's a few interesting features <clears throat> of it. Um, the, the very large paddock that you can see that occupies most of the left, all of that used to be government house land. And then I think in 1964, when the Tasman Bridge was being built, if you can imagine that being sliced in half, and that half was given to the Royal Tasmanian Botanical Gardens, it's where their French garden is, and so on and so forth. Apparently, the, 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 the gifting of that land was associated with the need for construction works for the bridge. But in any event, there's some very I see correspondence in our archives from the official secretary to the state government saying, how dare you give our land away to our neighbour? But anyway, they did that. Yes. And you can see the early Wilmot Wall very clearly there, which goes along in one direction and then at right angles. So now all of the early Wilmot Wall coming in this direction is in the Botanical Gardens and there are arches in it. Um, so you can go from one side to the other. And that wall dates back to 1843, so again, well before Government House was built. But as you can see there, I mean, it's quite a formidable wall, and the, the Governor's vegetable patch was there, even though the Government House was, was in town, and there was another veggie patch in Macquarie Street somewhere. Yeah. But th that wall was probably built to, for security, I guess, for the veggie patch, and maybe to keep wind yeah. off it. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and they continued to use the veggie patch when the Government House was built. Mm -hmm. So in those days they had gateways into it through that angle of the wall. And they've been bricked up and mm -hmm. you can see them today. Now, sticking with our wonderful friends, the Royal Tasmanian Botanical Gardens, when their conservatory was opened, I forget what year it was, uh, 
But just coming back to Government House, we've got four statues in plinths in our dining room. And at the time the conservatory, the gardens was being opened, the statues were in storage because I think a governor thought they weren't the right thing to have in your dining room. Something like that. (laughs) So the, the, the gardens had said, could we borrow two of your statues to put in our conservatory on our plinths because they look so nice? And that was done. And Leisha found a photograph of probably that statue on a plinth in the Botanical Gardens Conservatory. But where the intrigue comes in is that we didn't get those two statues back, and no one knows what happened to them. And again, there was some fairly frosty correspondence saying, well, where are our statues? You've already sort of nicked our land. But anyway, so some, some, someone said that they remember as a child seeing one of those statues in a workshop with its arms broken off, and others said maybe they got um, ruined in the rain because they're plaster of Paris. But it's just another mystery. But we love our neighbours. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what's that one? Oh, that's barely visible, but Kate yes. can well talk about that yes, one. Well, this is Mr. Westall's duty statement, and he was a gardener. And in the book, we have two chapters on staff, one on the house staff and one on um, the gardeners. We thought it was really important to include them in the history, and it was great fun researching them. And we had some really interesting uh, documents in the Government House collection dealing with staff, which caused me much amusement. So, yes, Mr. Westall's duty statement was interesting for a number of reasons. It did mention grapes, telling us that, yes, well, grapes were still growing at Government House in the 1950s when he was head gardener. We apparently got him from Mona Vale, but the history of the gardeners was also interesting. Oh, it's just fascinating, honestly. And that last one, was that Marina's? We so that was Marina Stickenberg. Sorry, I'll just, I'll just jump there. Yes, that was Marina Stickenberg. There's lots of Dickenbergs living in and around Hobart still, and so we had good chats with them. And that would have been a typical example that that's in the kitchen courtyard, so he would have probably been up nice and early to milk the cows. Because yes. at that stage there was still quite a fair amount of agricultural industry taking place at Government House, yes. even in that period. I yes. think the slaughtering had long stopped, yes. but not milking. So the Dickenberg family were at Government House for quite some time. They lived at Ross Bank at first, yes, and then they, they had a special yeah. house built for them, which is now... Um, which is now, which house is that one? Quite it's the one by the road, it? isn't it? Oh, that's yes. Lee's? It's Lee's house, yeah. yeah. Here's another example of staff movements. This is a group who had just arrived at Hobart Airport in 1951 from England. So they had come out, I guess, to be with the Cross family. And the lady, one of the ladies in the middle is the name of Ray Pegler. And she's still very much with us. She lives in Queensland, and we had some good correspondence with her about her and that merry group who came out. Yes, she was 17 or 18 when she came out. But she married in Tasmania. She met her husband at the dogs. That's right. (laughs) She did too. (laughs) So she told us about that. So we had some really interesting... um, interviews. This is another example of a young staffer. This is a lady who was very young there, Diane Smith. She lives, is she the one who lives in Queensland, Kate? No, she lives She lives up in the north, northwest north coast. coast. I yes. met her at Tanamenawake Day. That's right. That, she happened that, to tell me that I used to work at Government House. I said, oh, have you got any photographs? And so she sent us this. So she was a parlour maid for three years at Government House. <laughs> And there she is in the ballroom, actually. Yes, so that's right. we could look at the background, just interesting, the flowers they used in those days. Mm-hmm. But also, it's, it, David has often pointed out that it's so interesting that the big mirrors in the ballroom were curtained at that stage. We don't know why they did that, mm-hmm. unless they were broken. One could have been cracked yet. Yes. So we do know that one of, the, one of those giant mirrors was broken during the Second World War when they were being taken down for safety. So... Mm-hmm. There were lots of interesting <laughs> stories about staff too. So the Cross family also had Maltese footmen. Yes, they did. And so they used to get up to quite a bit of mischief, apparently, young Maltese footmen. And they were caught playing catchings with the sherry glasses. <laughs> so then they worked out why the numbers of sherry glasses had diminished so much. And this Susanna told us about this. Uh, there's lots of very funny stories. A few stories did not make it in the book. No. <laughs> this now goes back, I guess, to the architecture of the building. Um, I had mentioned in 1827 foundations. Then, when Sir John Franklin arrived, he uh, reinvigorated that, and more of the 
uh, government house was built, but he too was told to stop because he hadn't got the requisite permission from London. But of that 1841 foundations and part of the basement, that still exists in government house because you can see some of the basement rooms are very different to others. Now, and at the same time, um, this set of stairs here, for those of you who can see them, they are part of the 1841 plan, but they're well and truly with us. So obviously you can imagine you can go in and out of the green door and use the steps, but they terminate against a wall, so they're completely <laughs> useless. Yes. <laughs> so it's a real puzzle why an architect of the calibre of William Porden Kay, who was in charge of the ultimate design, why he would have thought, well, let's just leave those there. It's a mystery. But there they are, the stairs to nowhere. We love them. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, that one? one? Yes. Again, another strange mystery. At the back of the ballroom, we have the minstrel's gallery above the ballroom, right? That would have been in use all the time for balls and other functions. The door from the minstrel's gallery opens out right next to the main door of the royal suite. So now, can you imagine in the 19th century, musicians with their you know, bassoons and that walking out, and there's the royal. No way would that have been allowed to happen. So on the other side of the minstrel's gallery, and this goes back to the 1850s, one of the 1850s plans, of which there are, Tony, you might remember, there's about 120 up in archives, at least. We found this one, and there in the centre it says, Stairs to Orchestra. But they were never built. But there is an internal um, construction area where you can see that it was being readied for stairs. But I, I mentioned earlier they'd run out of money because they went so over budget. Yeah. So I yeah. guess they just abandoned that. But again, it's an interesting little historical feature. Okay. And this is a photograph of a garden party on the South Terrace. And we've included it in here because you can see at the top left-hand corner there is a fernery there. And we had read a lot about the fernery and wondered what had happened to it. And so there is an early photograph of it. And there's, and there's a remnant today, today a remnant of the fernery. But that was used for all sorts of purposes. It had lovely plants in it, but also at... Um, various fates they used to have. Yes. It was used for mind reading games in the fernery. So we'd always wondered, you know, where is the fernery? And now it's this is the position of this is the one of Penn Taylor's photos of a garden today on the South Terrace. So they're the pleached lines. And the fernery would have crossed at the end of that would have crossed the, right the gravel path. The, yes. It was yes. quite a big structure. Okay, where are we now? We've done is that the one we've done? So this is a bit of a change of subject. This is going back into the interior. When the building was uh, constructed in the 1853 to 1857, it was cutting edge architecture, a lot of it, um, even though it was also you know, very playful Victorian. But those interior lighting systems, we had Penn Taylor take them on three levels. She lay on her back on the main uh, passageway on the ground floor to take the top image which then when you go to the bottom left you see it as a balustrade and then it continues up through into the roof space bringing down that gorgeous light. Mm. So that was really cutting edge and it's most impressive to look at that mm. even today. Yeah. Okay. Go. Now, the governor in 1909-1913 was Sir Harry Barron and Lady Clara Barron I've taken that image. You probably can't see the gentleman with them. Too small. But anyway, that gentleman on their right was Sir Billy Hughes, the, the somewhat controversial Prime Minister. I've included it there simply because it's interesting to see that Governor and Lady Clara with him. And also the fact is the Barons, he was the Governor in WA for quite some years, and that's where that photograph is taken actually and we cropped it from I think all the parliamentarians yes but and of course Lady Barron on Flinders is, is named after Lady Barron and Falls oh that's right yes Lady Barron yes. Falls yes. that's it yes there we are jumping way back in time to 1868 when the first ever visit to Tasmania by a royal it was just such a big deal, even to the extent of putting a great big bonfire on the top of Mount Wellington. 
So he stayed at Government House for quite some weeks, I think. He did, yes. So they had birthday balls. They started, the first one was in actually in 1859, mm. and they would have a birthday ball each year, and um, sometimes more than one if they had a special visitor. Is that Prince Alfred? Uh, the first, the first ever, yes, yes 1868. Yes. Yeah, yeah. He was the only one of Queen Victoria's children to come to Australia, I believe. Yes, he was the second That's son, wasn't yes. he? He was the Duke of Edinburgh. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So this is an, an image from Sarah Mitchell's scrapbook, which is held in the Rare Books collection at the University of Tasmania. And this is reproduced in the Bowles chapter of the book because in this image, the girls are riding back from the ball back to Liz Dillon on the East Coast. Wow. So they got to the ball by riding all the way from Liz Dillon to Hobart, <laughs> stopping at Runnymede to stay the night and also at Richmond. And this image shows um, Miss... I forgot Sarah? Name. Sarah Mitchell? No, Sarah Mitchell and um, Kate Mitchell were the girls. Oh, right. But the, a person fell off a horse. She was accompanying yes, them at the time. Right. And she fell off and so... Um, Sarah, Kate had done a, done a drawing of it, so that's Kate, Kate's yes. drawing. And it's a gorgeous scrapbook. And also in that scrapbook we found that the Gore Brown's uh, private secretary... Yes, Mr who Chichester, saw, who was on sorry, horse. Earlier, ...had lost his eye by a sh champagne cork. <laughs> <laughs> so there are funny little bits in this. And there are also some other lovely drawings of the Gore Browns and their children. So this yeah, image yeah. is of my husband Dick's grandmother, Coralie Flexmore, and we've included her there because I was just intrigued about the Flexmores. Coralie's great-grandmother and great-grandfather were convicts. So the great-grandmother was on the first fleet and Francis Flexmore was on the second fleet. And I was amazed to see that at the very first ball at Government House, Francis Flexmore, son of, um, of the first Francis, was at the first ball as a guest. And so this is Coralie, she's the, um, the great-granddaughter of the convict, and she was a debutante at the ball and presented to the governor. And I thought, isn't that amazing that in one generation you can go from convict to a guest at a ball at Government House mm. in those days, which is pretty intriguing. Pretty amazing. Mm. Okay, I think we've just got two more slides, folks. Oh yes, so this is another picture of a ball, just to show how many people were invited to these balls. <laughs> so we have a chapter on balls, and it was we intriguing yes. reading. And of course they listed everybody who went in the newspaper, oh. so that's how I know that Francis Flexmore went to, to the first ball at Government House in 1859. That was, I think in. that one was about 1930, somewhere in the 30s. So, yes. Okay, final slide. Before the Second World War. Now, this is a slide that would be best if it was bigger, but it doesn't matter. Those four individuals are in what's the conservatory well before it was finally built, so it was an open veranda, and various structures were made as kind of roofs to keep it all... The reason we like it is that if you were to see those figures in close-up, they look completely shocked and scandalised at something that they're looking at. That would have been a garden party. Again, we came across the image rather by accident, I think. Mm. Um, I think it was the former editor of the Mercury, actually, who sent it to us. Yes, he sent us yes. terrific yes. images. Anyway, for that, really we'll useful. just leave it there if anyone wants to have a look at it, because it's quite amusing, really. Because the garden parties were very well written up. I was really frustrated reading these accounts because they could go on and on about who was there and what they were wearing and they wouldn't tell me what was happening in the garden so what was growing and what the garden looked like but obviously people wanted to read about themselves in the paper and so that's why they described the guests and their, their finery. Okay, well look, that's the, that's the talk, that's the PowerPoint. Um, I don't know if anyone has got any questions of any nature. Well, when did the governors change from being, I suppose, um, British uh, military figures to native-born and, I mean, obviously, yes. recently the distinguished line of um, legal people occupying the, the Yes. Office. It's an interesting question because 
certainly the earliest lieutenant governors were military figures, but by the time the Henry Fox Youngs were there, he, he was, I think he'd been a public servant. And, you know, the, the British governors from then right through until 1975 came from various backgrounds, including, for instance, that uh, from 1930 to 1933, Sahara, um, uh, the Irish O'Grady... Uh, uh, Sir James O'Grady. Sir James O'Grady came here as a, a person who was a Labour politician and an Irishman, and the, the local media were up in arms. How can we have this? Yeah. But he, came, he became very popular. And, I mean, it is interesting that, it, that governors were British until 1975, when Sir Stanley was the first Australian-born governor, and then Sir Guy Green, the first Tasmanian-born governor, 1995. That's not to have anything against the British governors, but you know there was a lot of agitation for to have local people. And in fact, they, for a long time, they were called imported governors. And for a period during the 1920s, the government house was actually empty for six years because the British governors kind of stayed away. But there are often, rather than... There were many from the army and navy and so on, but... They tended to be colonial public servants, so quite often they had many postings as governor. So you'd often find they'd have you know three or four postings in different places, mm -hmm. didn't they, David? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So you know, yeah. Straw and Weld, all of those governors at that time had other postings. Yeah, no, very much so. But yes, they're interesting in themselves. Tony, David, I know you've been fairly careful to keep parts of your working life separate. Yes. But I wonder if you've ever actually taken Detective Inspector Heineken to Government House. No, <laughs> I haven't. You know, that's a, that's that, that's such a good question because um, obviously I've been an author well before I became anything to do with Government House, and I I never speak about my my books at Government House, but clearly there's people who come there who know me and say what's going on with Pat Fishner. Otherwise, I keep mum because, and seriously, folks, if I was to say, well, to some random person at Government House, hey, I ha happen to write fiction, if you want to go down to the Hobart Bookshop or Fuller's, <laughs> I would be using my public position to, to benefit a private business. And we know what happens there. So I tend not to talk about it. But I mean, th Rick got on the radio asked the other day, was talking about the quarry pond, and I did mention the possibility of a body in it. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any more, Shani? Any follow up? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I, I wonder if there are any images on record of the first government house that was um, yeah. started mm. and yes. uh, partially demolished. Uh, whether there are any records? Uh, yes, we have a painting in the drawing room of the first government house, oh, okay. and there are a number of images. Th there's quite a few images of the original government yes. house. The, the one that we've referred to, if that's the one you're referring to, the, the potential foundations in 1827, then again in 1840. Oh, is that what you meant? So if that's oh, what you did haven't you mean? found anything. Th that was a very, uh, very formal uh, Georgian house, a long house. And there's lots of plans. Um, we've never seen an actual image of a partly constructed building, but there's plenty of plans, and, and yes, they, they are very interesting. It, apparently the workmanship that was put into it originally was very poor. So This is the Franklin. I think we're at cross Oh, sorry. Are we here? talking about the original government house in, in Franklin Square? No, the one in our city. The, the one before this one that you were talking about. Yes. Today. That was partly built in 1841? Mm. Mm. Or the one near... Franklin Square, do yeah, you mean? That's right. uh, no, no, he's talking about the one that was partly built on the side. Yes, and oh, then right. yes. demolished. So oh, right. the closest, I, I haven't seen any imagery of it, but I do have, and there is, it is in the book, where <clears throat> an individual was walking along, it was at about 1842 or 3, <clears throat> just at the time when Sir John Franklin's <clears throat> um, second government house had been ordered to be stopped. And this individual was walking along, and he said, I walked past the... The, to the proposed government house, and he said, I didn't know whether to call it a nearly, a nearly complete this or a nearly incomplete that. It's just a jumble, a big jumble. Mm -hmm. So it was not insubstantial. And so there's, there's, a, there's a, a word description of it. Yes. But nothing that I've seen that's an, an image. I don't think you found anything saying it was poorly constructed. Or no, like nothing that. to do with that. The, the, right. the original government house in Macquarie Street was definitely a dodgy building. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> More questions? Okay. There are opportunities in the Colonial Gallery to have a look at the material I mentioned. I've got these uh, handouts 
which not only include the way to order a set of books, which we all have to have now because we couldn't see the images properly and we really want to. Thank you so much, Amanda. Thank you, folks. Thanks. Thank you.